Alright, I'm a possum and I find garbage. I guess this is my Halloween special, which means I gotta review a horror movie. I mean, half the movies I review are horror movies, so I guess there's really nothing special about it. But look, we got pumpkins. Anyway, today's garbage is Anomaly, a haunted house movie from 2016, and the second best thing that happened to America that year. Now, this movie's kind of special because it was actually requested by one of my viewers who said their stepdad wrote and directed it. Well, were you planning on showing this video to him? Planning on recording his reaction while I tear his baby apart? You better hope he doesn't take off his belt, you disrespectful little turd. Anyway, it's, it's kind of funny how this terrifying true story is conveniently composed of haunted house movie cliches, as if it was just assembled from elements taken from other slightly less terrible true stories without any thought or originality. Just based on the fact that it's a haunted house movie and every haunted house movie has the same plot, I tried to guess what would happen before I even watched it. It would start with a family moving into a new house. The family dog would start barking at seemingly nothing. The youngest kid would make friends with the ghost or demon, but the parents would just assume it's an imaginary friend. Increasingly strange things would happen, like unidentified noises at night and objects moving on their own, until something unmistakably supernatural happened. The family would call a priest or psychic who would tell them they have an evil spirit of some sort. The family would find out there was a murder or some other evil shenanigans at the house before they moved in. One of the parents would get possessed by the evil spirit. The possessed parent would try to kill at least one of the kids. The other parent and the priest or psychic would tie up the possessed parent to conduct an exorcism. The parent would be successfully exorcised, and the family would either flee from the haunted house or conclude the ghost or demon was gone and be proven wrong by one last scare at the end of the movie. Now, to the movie's credit, only six of those ten stock plot elements happen in this movie. But the movie is only 72 minutes long, it was made on a budget just big enough to pay for the camera rental. So I'm guessing they would have checked more of those boxes if they had more time and money. But honestly, if I wasn't specifically asked to give my opinion on this movie, I probably never would have even watched it, just based on the online descriptions making it sound like the most generic horror movie ever. And even if I did, it's so unremarkable that I would have forgot about it as soon as it ended. Oh, of course! Of course a ghost has to come in here while I'm talking about a ghost movie! Well, I... What? What the f*** do you want? I'm the symbolism ghost. I represent failure and regret. Well, that must be true because I'm currently regretting my failure to lock the door. Silence! I represent your failure to be original. You complain about the cliches in this movie, but you're doing the whole angry reviewer thing, complete with skits featuring secondary characters who show up to annoy the host. Don't you have any self-awareness? Well, obviously I do because I wrote you into the script for this video. And your fourth wall-breaking acknowledgement shows you clearly regret it. But just because you acknowledge that what you're doing is unoriginal and hypocritical, that doesn't excuse it. The skits aren't meant to be groundbreaking. The only reason I started writing skits into my reviews in the first place was to act as segues into my Patreon shout-out. Speaking of which... Alex Bones, Ashley Mary Johnson, Being Positive, Skin is Success, Black Magic 95, Bone Guy, Boop Dupes, Richter 699, Charlie, Chocolate Mussolini, Chris Herrera, Chris Nicky, Christopher Wall, Cole Marlini, Corey Zilligan, John Sindel, Diesel Weasel, Eduardo Sanchez, Rackle Soraya, Frank the Ginger Degenerate, Grey Devil, Hey Rina Ned Penna, I Fisted a Pair, Jan Kavura, Jimmy Jan, Joe Burr, John Cleveland, John Ford, John Walton, Joseph Reagan, Josh Lybar, K55, Kaiser Will in the second, Large Metallic Fellow, Lesquid of Quebec, Lil Toronto, Lip, Marco McBire, Mario Mendez, Exquisite, Michael Bouye, Michael Lowe, Nicholas, Noble Team 33, Pete Paco, Ricky Peruga, Rafa Coffer, Ron Elba, Real Inceptor, Samurai Prize, Steve Von Brooklyn, the 17th, Spurdo 1998, those people are assholes. Yeah, they are, but they're also the only reason you exist. Yeah, I didn't think of that one, did you, f***o? Enjoy your existential nightmares, you prick! The movie starts with text explaining the definition of the word spirit because they assume anybody watching this movie is some kind of idiot. Then we see some underexposed woman conducting an interview with some off-screen narrator, Asking her what she knows about the Hagen family. Okay, then start. From where? From the very beginning. No, start from the end and work backwards. We cut to the director showing off his fancy drone footage, and we see a car driving down the road. The narrator explains that the mother of somebody named Cindy died from cancer, and then her father, Richard, found a new girlfriend. We then see Richard with his new fiance, Paige who proceed to relay heavy-handed expository information to the audience. I'm so happy we finally got our own place. I think it's time to put that baby making a use. Really? 
You already have two kids of your own. I have two of my own. I want one with you. I'm their stepmom. I'm fine with what we have. I hope she doesn't think I'm replacing her mom. The scene does this weird thing where the narrator is talking about the sad topic of a family coping with death, but the happy, upbeat music from the car radio is playing in the background. It creates this unintentional tonal dissonance. He was depressed for a pretty long time. And come to think of it, why do we even have a narrator? Why do we need this framing device of this unseen character being interviewed to explain what's happening in the story? Why do we need a narrator to explain that this father of two kids had his wife die and he's getting remarried if they're just going to bluntly explain that in dialogue in the exact same scene anyway? It feels like the narrator wasn't something they planned from the beginning, but was thought of late in the production because they needed some way of explaining what's happening in the story later on because they didn't do a good enough job of getting the point across through on-screen action. I mean, I don't know if that is what happened, but that's what it feels like, because otherwise the framing device of the interview serves no purpose other than to destroy our immersion into the story by reminding us that's just a story every time the narrator opens her stupid mouth. Anyway, Richard and Paige drive up to the house while the narrator explains things which really don't need to be explained. They bought this house without knowing the background of it. Though again, overly long montage of Paige and Richard cleaning up the house. Well, really, it's Paige who's doing the cleaning. Did I mention a man wrote and directed this movie? Later that night, Paige and Richard hear a noise outside, but they think nothing of it. We cut to the interview lady for five seconds for absolutely no reason, and then we cut to Paige brushing her hair in her disgusting new bathroom, but this adds nothing to the movie, so then we cut to her looking through one of their boxes, where she finds the movie's first jump scare. Okay, so she finds a snake in the box, and then just casually closes it and walks away. And the movie just cuts to the next scene. And it's never brought up again. We don't find out what she did with the snake, she never mentions it to anybody, she never wonders how it got there, and it never becomes relevant to the plot. It's like they got worried that we're seven minutes in and the movie hasn't had anything scary happen yet, so they just threw in this completely disconnected jump scare. And it's not even like the snake itself is scary, they just threw in an obnoxiously loud sound effect. There could have been anything in the box, it would have had the same effect. Can I just talk about how much I hate jump scares for a minute? First of all, they very rarely work on me because I've seen so many bad horror movies that I can almost always see them coming. But even if they did still work on me, I would still find them annoying because it's not a real scare. It's just something popping up and startling you. Well, is there really a difference between being scared and being startled? Yes! When a movie is genuinely scary, it sticks with you long after the movie's over. It affects you on a visceral level and makes you remember it, giving you nightmares, and makes you afraid to take out the garbage at night. A jump scare doesn't do that, it just makes you jump a little, and then it's instantly gone. And modern audiences are so accustomed to jump scares, that now the quality of a horror movie is measured by how many jump scares they have, with no regard for tone or execution. You could take something visually and tonally identical to the f***ing Trolls movie, and just have something pop up to startle the audience once in a while, and that would be considered a horror movie in today's world, because that's all that matters to the dumb popcorn-eating masses who flock to these kinds of movies and reward their low-effort bull****. It's so cheap and easy to do, even I- <laughs> Okay, so after Paige sees and does nothing about the snake, we cut to her making tea in the kitchen, and then it just abruptly cuts to her answering the phone. What was the point of that tea scene? Really, why does the movie keep cutting to Paige doing mundane tasks that have nothing to do with anything? She brushes her hair for a few seconds, then we get a pointless scene of her finding a snake in a box, and then she's making tea for a few seconds, and then she's answering the phone. And does this all take place in the same day? because her outfit keeps changing. Is this the movie's way of implying the passage of time? Because I didn't get that the first time watching it. Anyway, Paige talks to her soon-to-be stepdaughter, Cindy, on the phone. It's a vapid conversation that doesn't tell the audience anything we need to know that we don't already know, and then she hangs up and hears the sound of a little kid laughing and stomping around. Yeah, I guess we're doing the whole creepy little kid thing. Was this movie generated by an AI or something? Paige gets up to investigate and hears some voices, but then nothing happens. We cut back to the interview woman, nothing happens again, then we cut to Richard and Paige pulling up in their car with the kids, Cindy, the older daughter, and Tommy, whose haircut makes you want to slap his parents. They go inside and immediately, Cindy looks at the piano as creepy music plays. 
Usually when a character looks at something with this kind of expression while creepy music plays, that implies they feel some kind of fear or apprehension about that thing. So is the movie implying that she's sensing something? Because nothing else in this movie implies that she has ghost sensing abilities or anything like that. And then we see her playing the piano in the very next scene. So I guess she's not afraid of it. So what was the point of that? It's like the director had some understanding of the language of cinema, but just didn't have anything to say, so they just used to say gibberish. So Cindy plays the piano. <laughs> really? Paige shows Cindy her room. Cindy thanks her for being so kind to her. Thank you for being so kind to me. And then we cut to Richard and Tommy throwing a football back and forth. Then Paige joins in, then Cindy, and then they all just look at their new house and smile, behaving the way families only ever do in movies and advertisements. Then we cut back to the interview. If you move into a house infected by demons, don't expect to get approached by them on your first nights of the house. First they make you feel comfortable, then they attack. They attack. Demons sound a lot like Taco Bell. So later that night, Cindy wakes up to the sound of someone banging on the door. She tries to wake up Richard, but he won't. So she decides to walk up to the door in that really slow way people only ever do in horror movies. Can I just talk about how much I hate this trope? Nobody moves slow when they're scared. If you hear something suspicious in the middle of the night, you're gonna treat that with urgency to find out what it is as quickly as possible. And I know why they do that in movies. Drawing it out is supposed to build up suspense. But you know what, it doesn't work, because we're still in the first act of the movie, so we know that all the scares at this point are just gonna be fake-outs. So we know that when she opens that door, there's not gonna be anything there. This trick doesn't work on anyone who has ever seen a horror movie before, so you're really just wasting time. So of course she opens the door, unarmed, in the middle of the night, like no smart person would ever do in real life. But this is a crappy horror movie, so predictably there's nothing there. But also like some kind of idiot, she steps outside to look around, and then horror movie cliche number 43 happens. <laughs> so the door mysteriously slams shut on its own, and Paige looks in the window and sees herself having dinner with the kids or whatever, and then horror movie cliche number 98 happens. <laughs> Suck my dick, movie. So it was all just a nightmare, and Paige tells Richard about it. The doorbell rang? No, it didn't. There was a knock. Then a horn blares as we cut to a tree for some reason. Which I guess is supposed to mean something. Is it because Poltergeist had a creepy tree? And what's that light? Is that supposed to be the moon? Because it's obviously a tungsten light with a blue gel pinned to the barn doors. You can even see the light stand. Like, what is this shot? They were so proud of it that they just had to shoehorn it into this random point in the movie? Then we cut to Cindy laying in bed. She's woken up by the sound of her door repeatedly banging against the wall, but then nothing happens. The following afternoon, Cindy asks Tommy if he's experienced anything weird in their new house, but he says no, so she tells him about the door. I hear my own... my own... room door opening on its own at night. It's painfully obvious that the dialogue in this scene is 80 yard, but I guess that's better than not being able to hear it so they get a point for that. We then cut to Paige taking a bath while listening to old 1930s swing music because it's cheap to license. I'll never fall again. And just like the hair brushing and tea making scenes, nothing happens. Then we cut to the interview lady again, and then to Cindy pulling- Oh f off! Then we see Paige reading a bedtime story to Tommy which is pretty weird considering how old he is. Then we see Cindy trying to use the Ouija board to contact her dead mother. Then Tommy comes walking in, and he wants to play with the Ouija board. I wanna play! <laughs> if you don't let me play, I'm gonna tell Dad what you're doing with your boyfriend in my grandma's bed. <laughs> but it's okay, I don't wanna play anymore. Okay. As Tommy's leaving, Cindy tells him to come back and they play with the Ouija board together. We cut to Richard and Paige talking about the car in an awkwardly short scene. I have problems with the car again. Really? Yeah, I think it's overheating. We need a new car. Then we cut back to Cindy and Tommy. Paige asks the spirits or whatever if their mom is in the home. The spirit makes the cursor move around, so Cindy asks its name, but the spirit spells out the name Morgan. I'm not moving it, the spirit is. What's a spirit? What? So they ask Morgan the spirit why she's there, and she tells him she wants him out of the house, then slams the door to scare them. 
I'm going to bed. Your game sucks. How old is this kid supposed to be? He looks like he's at least 10. But the fact that he's listening to bedtime stories and he doesn't know what a spirit is tells me he's meant to be five or six. Were they not able to find a younger kid to play this character? Why not just rewrite him to be older? Or do they just not know how kids behave? Then we see Richard getting mad at his car. He closes the hood. Then we get another jump scare. What the, the ghost girl disappears right before Richard's eyes. And then a plate falls on its own while Paige is doing the dishes. Then nobody says anything about these ghostly shenanigans the next morning. Can you give me some milk, please? Ew, 2%? It's then suddenly night again. What is it with this movie and these really short, pointless scenes? You know, this should be obvious, but I guess I need to point out that every scene in a movie should serve some kind of narrative purpose. What, what information is being conveyed to the audience in this scene? That Richard has a job? Because I think we could have made that assumption about a widow war with two kids in a house. I get to work 20 long hours. Yeah, okay, he's going to be working overtime today. What does that have to do with anything? Why is this important? So I guess it's nighttime again, and we see Paige walking down the hallway. A creepy little kid appears behind her, but she doesn't see it. So I guess the ghost just decides to appear for the sake of the audience. Then we cut to Cindy walking around the living room, which has these bright orange lights pointed at the windows for some reason. She sees a pram from the 1800s roll into the hallway, accompanied by a really loud baby crying sound effect. So then Cindy gets up in, as slowly as humanly possible, she walks over to the mysterious pram to lift the blanket, because touching some mysterious pram with ghostly baby noises coming from it seems like a good idea to her. But then a hand reaches up and grabs her throat, so she screams, but then it just disappears. Nobody in the house wakes up or comes running or anything, the movie just kind of cuts to the next scene, which I guess is supposed to be a different night because now Richard is in the living room. The editing in this movie is driving me nuts. I ain't talking about the good kind of nuts, like the kind you find at the manhole in Chicago. For real, they got good nuts in the vending machine. They have a brand that I can't find anywhere else. So anyway, Richard reads a book in the dark like a normal person as the camera zooms in on a clock that's so underexposed that I had to lean into my screen to figure out what it was. But then the record player or whatever turns on and starts distorting. Richard hears something making noise outside, but then the lights go out. So Richard grabs a candle instead of a flashlight like it's the Middle Ages or something, and goes outside to look around. He picks up a thing that fell over, then goes inside and gets jump scared by Cindy. What happened to the lights? They went out. Cindy complains about a weird smell in a room that we never find out about and never gets brought up again. And then we see Paige wake up in the middle of the street. She sees something we can't see, so she runs a good 40 feet before stopping by a tree. And then she screams at something. Ah! Really? Again? <laughs> Whoa, what a horrible nightmare. I dreamed I was reviewing some crappy, unoriginal horror movie. Nah, it wasn't a dream. Cthulhu? Who let you in? Well, after you informed the symbolism ghost of why he exists, he killed himself. And you already used Sasquatch in the last video, so now I'm here to fill the mid-video skit quota. Oh. Okay, so do we have a funny situation to navigate or something? No. This is normally the part where you would shoehorn in the Patreon shout-out, but you already did that. Oh yeah. Well, I guess we could just- wait, what's that? Ah! What the hell is happening? It's a plot contrivance! It's sucking the credibility out of our story! It sucks worse than my mom, which my dad says is the only reason I'm even here right now. I can't hold on much longer! Awesome! Cthulhu! Avenge me! I won't! Well, that was annoying. So Paige lays back down, but then it turns out there's a zombie next to her in bed. But I guess it was just an illusion or something. She tries to tell Richard what she saw, but he doesn't see it. Then she tells him there's something right behind him. There's someone right behind you. So Richard turns around real slow like no one in a scary situation actually ever would. But there's no one there. So Richard and Paige are about to make their way to the living room. But then a window breaks and a scary wind noise comes in. So they all run to the living room. I don't want to be in this house anymore! Then the kids get on the school bus the next morning, then Richard tells Paige he called a priest named Father Joseph. Then the movie does that thing where a character sneaks up on another character and puts their hand on their shoulder and scares them, 
which is not something I've ever seen anybody ever do outside of a bad horror movie. Stop it. Anyway, it's the next door neighbor, Lisa, who's only now just introducing herself to them, even though they moved in probably a week ago by now. Richard asks her if she knows anything about the previous owners of the house, but she doesn't know anything. Sometime later, Richard and Paige are hanging up laundry to dry like it's the 1950s or something. Richard tells her he's taking a couple days off from work. Paige gets upset about this because she's a woman. Then Richard goes into the shed and finds a cookie jar which makes cartoon fairy chime noises when he opens it. What the hell? Then we see Father Joseph show up. Richard lets him in, and then they send him to the bedroom where he hears a ghostly voice. The voice has become louder, then scary music starts playing, so he starts reading from his gigantic Bible. In the name of the Father, and in the Son, and the, the Holy Spirit. Father Joseph does his priest stuff, then he goes back to the living room where he asks Richard and Paige to describe what supernatural things they've seen. Father Joseph gives them a blessed cross necklace and tells them to hang it up somewhere to keep the unwanted energy away. It's blessed, and it will keep any unwanted energy away from your home. I assume he's using the word energy in the New Age sense of the word, of some ill-defined mystical presence that only scientifically illiterate assholes and con artists use. But what I don't understand is why Father Joseph has clear shave stubble on the bald part of his head. Do they actually shave back the actor's hairline to make him look older? Richard follows Father Joseph outside and shows him the cookie jar he found. Father Joseph looks inside it and gets all scared and leaves without telling Richard what the big deal is. Which is kind of weird considering his expertise in paranormal activity and evil spirits is the whole reason they called him in the first place. I hope he's not getting paid. I want to just comment on the look of this movie for a moment. Now, they ain't gonna win any awards for it, but for the most part, this movie actually looks like a movie. There's some attempt at mood lighting, and they even did that hideous blue and orange color grade that Hollywood was obsessed with a few years ago. According to the credits, this movie was shot on an actual cinema camera from Red, and they used Rokinon lenses. And I'm guessing they used the Cine DS line because the Zine series didn't exist in 2016. Which would mean they spent good money renting an expensive Hollywood level camera, but then used cheapo lenses for fat wannabe filmmaker assholes who shoot on DSLR mirrorless cameras like me. But for real, the Rokinon Cine DS lenses are pretty cool because they're among the very few Cine lenses on the market that have filter threads, so you don't need to use a matte box to use ND filters. Maybe they should have taken advantage of that and used ND filters on this movie. Then they wouldn't have had to crank up the shutter speed during the daylight scenes, which is why they look all jittery and don't have any motion blur. Yeah, that's right, I noticed. Then we cut to the interview lady asking the narrator who the ashes belong to, and the narrator says they belong to somebody named Morgan Le Fay, a woman born in 1913 who was murdered by her second husband in a satanic ritual in 1983, and now she haunts the house looking for a child who she believed was stolen from her. Yeah, they had to get the narrator to explain all that. In a real movie, they would have had a flashback, or had a character discover this while reading old newspapers in a local library, or have a protagonist talk to a paranormal expert or something. You know, something better fitting the visual medium of a movie. Also, I guess the cookie jar is supposed to be an urn. They couldn't just buy an urn to use as a prop. What was the budget of this movie? Sometime later, Richard tells Paige he has to work overtime again. I guess that whole taking time off thing is cancelled out now. Why even bring it up in the movie, they're just gonna negate it two scenes later. So I guess Richard goes to work, and then the next night, some invisible force pulls Tommy's bed. He looks under his bed, sees nothing, then we see Paige wake up and stand around for a while. Tommy starts walking to Cindy's room, a skateboard rolls out and startles him, but he doesn't think anything of it, I guess because skateboards moving on their own in the middle of the night is just a normal occurrence. Then he sees the ghost girl playing the piano, but they forgot to dub in the piano music, so it comes across like she's just sitting there and not doing anything. Tommy screams, and this time somebody actually hears it. Cindy runs to Paige's room, but she's not there. Then everything goes dark. Cindy finds a flashlight and points it at her own face like some kind of idiot. Then she shines the light around and sees the ghost girl. Then she immediately points the flashlight at her own face again. Who the f*** would ever do that? Who would ever see a ghostly stranger in their house and then immediately take their eyes off them? Wow, maybe she's too scared to look at it. That's not how humans work. People look away when they're watching a scary movie. They don't look away from something that could potentially kill them. Was this movie written and directed by an alien who has never interacted with a human before? Well, how else are they gonna light up the actor's face? Have the character pick up a lantern instead of a flashlight. 
but that would light up the whole room. Then they couldn't do the scary peekaboo gag. How about they just don't then? F off. So Cindy points the flashlight at the ghost, then herself, then the ghost again, then herself again, then the ghost is gone, and then the music drops out so we know the other jump scare is coming. <sighs> Tommy picks up the flashlight, sees a scary face, and then a ghost grabs his ankle. But then uh, they both just run out of the house. I guess the ghost just let him go. Richard pulls up in his car in a shot that's so poorly color graded that the blown out porch light is crushed down to 50 IRE, turning it into an ugly grayish yellow that doesn't look natural at all. Then he goes looking for Paige. He finds her naked in the shed with her body wrapped around the cookie urn. Everybody goes to Lisa's house and they tell her about the ghosts. Lisa reacts in a way which suggests she knows what's up, even though she told them she didn't know anything about what happened to the house's previous owners in an earlier scene. Oh god, you need to call the cops. So she's either a liar, or she's just instantly ready to believe her neighbors when they tell her their house is haunted and her reaction is just poorly acted. So I guess they called the cops, because the next thing we know, they're leading a guy who's supposed to be a police officer into their house, but he's not wearing a uniform, I guess because they couldn't get one for the movie. What is it with these movies and having cops without uniforms? You know you could just buy one, right? Anyway, they hear some spooky noises, then some invisible force knocks them over and Paige gets dragged down the hallway. And then they just carry her outside, so I guess the ghost is just, just let her go again. Is the ghost just trolling them or something? The cop tells them he can't do anything and they should just contact the church. I don't know what they expected the cop to do, but then he walks away, I assume to go shave since he forgot that police officers aren't supposed to have beards. Richard says they should all stay out of the house until they can get the priest to come, but then Paige says she wants to go back inside. I wanna go back inside. Richard says no, but Paige yells. I'm gonna go back inside! So Paige gets up and goes back into the house. She's obviously possessed now, because, you know, haunted house movie tropes. The narrator tells the interview lady that the cop didn't report what he saw because technically no crimes are committed. Then Father Joseph comes back. Richard takes him to Paige, and then he sits them down to explain how supernatural shenanigans work. This terrible problem you guys are suffering from is being caused by spirits. Oh gee, thanks Father. We didn't already know that. So this particular spirit likes to torment people. So it is a troll spirit. And they need to figure out what it wants. But then they realize Paige is hyperventilating, and she starts freaking out. So Father Joseph realizes she's possessed. What do you want with this family? But then Paige snaps out of it. Then Father Joseph tries to communicate with the spirit. I want to know... Why are you in this house? They hear some thumping sounds, but it won't talk. So they do the one knock for yes, two knocks for no thing. One knock for yes! Two knocks for no! So from this, we learn that the spirit is a woman, it wants the family to leave, and it's mad at Paige for some reason. I don't think it's ever explained why. Okay, so why is the ghost or demon or whatever possessing Paige? I thought the folklore is that they go after people who are emotionally vulnerable. So why not possess the guy whose wife died just a couple of years ago? Or one of the kids whose mom died? Then you could have a theme about learning to let go and overcome your demons or whatever. I mean, you don't have to incorporate this element into the movie, but I just don't understand why the stepmom is the one who gets possessed. Other than maybe because the mom in The Conjuring got possessed, and they're just flagrantly ripping it off. Really, why does the ghost possess Paige? Why the goblin turn on the stove? We cut back to the interview, and the narrator explains the spirit of Morgan was targeting everybody, not just Paige, contradicting the last scene. And also that there's some white-faced demon that attached itself to Cindy. I assume they mean the scary face Tommy saw when he picked up the flashlight, which never interacts with Cindy in this movie until the very last scene, by the way. But I guess it's attached to her now for some reason. Then we cut to Father Joseph sitting outside. Richard joins him and says he gave Paige sleeping pills to knock her out, and then he has his Oscar moment. Father, I can't take it anymore. Have faith, Richard. Everything's going to be okay. You don't know that. So Father Joseph essentially tells Richard to stop being a p and then they hear the kids yelling, so they rush inside and find Paige standing in the living room. But now there's upside down crosses painted on the walls because that's instant horror right there. So they send the kids outside. What do we do? What do we do? Let's go get the neighbors. Get the neighbors? What are the neighbors gonna do? Father Joseph tells Richard to tie Paige to a chair, and he starts conducting an exorcism on her. 
probably should have done that when she first started showing signs of possession. Father Joseph shows the spirit of Morgan, who's possessing Paige, the cookie urn which contains her ashes, but she's not impressed. Now it's time for you to go. You have no reason here. If I go, take it her with me, you fat, filthy bastard! Morgan says she wants Paige's energy, whatever that means. What do you want with her? Her energy. Her energy? Morgan also says they can get rid of her by praying, but she says it in a way that sounds like she's saying, by brain. How could I get rid of you? By brain. <laughs> Pray to who? Lucifer! So this kind of sh goes on for a while until Lisa suddenly comes in from nowhere to help pull down Paige while Father Joseph prays, but it doesn't work. Suddenly it starts raining indoors and everybody's eyes start bleeding like Joe Biden. Richard holds up a mirror to Paige for some reason, so Morgan kicks it. Then Father Joseph just kind of falls over and dies. And I guess Paige is dead now too. Good. We cut back to the interview, and the narrator explains that Tommy and Cindy win the car with Richard driving down Route 66, because it's just one six short of the scary number, when Richard suddenly decided to shoot Tommy and himself, but Cindy got away. And I guess that's the end of the story. So the narrator gets up and reveals to the audience that she's Cindy, but before she goes, the interviewer asks her one last question. One last question. This demon that was haunting Cindy. You mean the demon that never did anything throughout the whole movie? Yes, I too would like to know what happened to him. Did she ever get rid of it? I guess not. So that's Anomaly. Hmm. Speaking of anomalies, I wonder where that plot contrivance vortex sent Cthulhu. Ugh, my head. Where am I? Oh no! This is the worst Halloween special ever! That's the end of the video. Uh, like it, and subscribe, and leave a comment because the, the algorithm likes it. And uh, support me on Patreon and submit your, your fan art. All the links are in the description. Bye.